second. First, I have announcements. One, uh, hopefully you all signed in. In the spring, we have another lecturer coming, and his name is Dr. Christopher Kayser. That's K-A-C-Z-O-R. Rhymes with Razor. That's what it says on his bio, anyway. Um, <laughs> And he is also a fantastic speaker. If you're familiar with the Catholic bioethics scene, you've probably seen him. He writes the theology and philosophy piece at the end of the National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly. So he's coming in the spring, so look for an email about that. Um, second, afterward there will be refreshments. So these lectures aren't meant to just be completely passive on your part. It's meant to stimulate discussion, and food aids us in at least well, maybe it doesn't need us in discussion, but it'll keep you here for a little while if you're hungry. <laughs> so it'll be in the back afterward. Uh, third, if you'd like to support the work of the lecture series in bringing fantastic academics, Catholic academics, to Baton Rouge, there will be a place to put donations uh, on the table, especially if you like the cheese. Fantastic. <laughs> um, four. Uh, outside, it's already sold out, I think. Uh, some of our students are selling boudin to bring, did I say that right? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. 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 I've been here four years, so I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> They're selling boudin for something related to um, global, hunger. Global, global hunger. That's it. So it's a really important part of our Catholic and Franciscan mission as well, is to serve the poor. So thank you for all of you who purchased some. Uh, I think the last thing I'd like to do before I introduce our speaker is, Dr. Holland, are you here? She's right here. I am. Dr. Holland is here. So I'd like to recognize our president and thank her for all the support she's given to this endeavor and for hosting us on campus. She's fantastic. Thanks for doing That's that. That's it. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker tonight, Father Nicanor Ostriaco. We use his textbook in bioethics classes, so a lot of the students are in the bioethics class. This is the person who wrote your textbook. Wow. So afterward, you corner him and ask him for answers. <laughs> Not at all, right, for the test. Um, one of the reasons I'm really excited to welcome him tonight is he has a doctorate in molecular biology from MIT and a doctorate in theology from Freiburg. So he's uniquely situated to deal with faith science questions. And he's the author of over 50 research papers, either co-authored or singularly authored. And obviously he has a fantastic bioethics textbook, which we use. So without further ado, uh, Father Nicanor. Thank you so much. Is it on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, John, for the kind invitation to come back, to come to the tropics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's already fall in Rhode Island. And when I got off the plane yesterday, I was like, whoa, I'm back in Manila. <laughs> so I, I grew up in Asia. I'm Filipino by birth, but I grew up in Manila. And I also, and Bangkok, before coming to the United States to do my undergraduate and graduate degree. So it was a great gift to, it is a gift, to come back to the tropics even for a couple of days. And it's just, it's been a wonderful day to meet the students and the faculty and the staff here at this, at this wonderful university at the heart of Baton Rouge. So this, this afternoon I'd like to talk about Adam and Eve. And I'd like to talk about Adam and Eve in a sophisticated way that engages faith and reason. Now, I'm a biology professor, and I run a research laboratory where my students and I are looking at where, in, in fact, we're just about to begin a screen looking for small molecule inhibitors for an endoplasmic reticulum localized channel leak that is upregulated in prostate cancer. That's the last thing I'm going to say for the bio part that I have. <laughs> Our gene is going to show up on one of the slides. And when we go off to meetings, um, I go as a priest, because I am a priest. I'm first and foremost a priest. And I think my students forget that it's very weird that their PI is a priest. 
So when we go to the AACR, the American Association for Cancer Research Meeting, or the ASBMB, which is the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and I walk in in my robe and collar, it freaks out a lot of people. <laughs> and my students will always, you know, they'll go, who's that? And they're like, oh, he's, he's my PI. And the very first question they ask my students is, does he believe in evolution? It's very striking that they get that. And my students will say, yes, he does. And then they'll say, well, why? And the answer I tell my students is, because there's a lot of really good data. And so what I would like to do today is to bring that evolutionary perspective into conversation with theology, not just to show, to talk about how, no, to talk about how that's done, but to actually show you how we can do that. And so I'm going to first frame the question that we have at hand, and it's the following. So if you, this is Father Jack Mahoney, he's a Jesuit who's now retired at Boston College in Boston. And in his book on evolution, he will say this, I argue that with the acceptance of the evolutionary origin of humanity, there is no longer a need or a place in Christian beliefs for the traditional doctrines of original sin, the fall, and human concupiscence resulting from that sin. And there are, this is actually pretty much the consensus amongst many, many theologians today. Another example, this is John Hawk. He's a lay professor in the theology department at Georgetown. He will say, evolutionary science has rendered the original cosmic perfection one allegedly debauched by a temporally original sin obsolete and unbelievable. And they're not alone. A lot of people today, not even in the academy, are wondering how we can reconcile an evolutionary perspective of the world with an authentic account of original sin and the fall. And so the question, though, that I have raised when I meet uh, my colleagues who deny this is the following. Doesn't the coherence of the Christian worldview not require an account of an original man, an original fall. If you, it's like a Jenga tower. If you pull this out, will the tower be able to stand? And I'm proposing that this is one of those bricks that has to be in place in order for the Christian gospel to remain coherent and intelligible. And you'll say, why is that? It's because of the following. What will happen if you remove the doctrine of the original sin? Well, then you would have to say the following. Sin flows from human nature as God had intentionally created it. In other words, God created us broken. He created us defective and in an imperfect state. And this is very hard to reconcile with the view of God that the Savior of the world described in Luke's Gospel when he said, would a good and gracious father who would not give his sons and daughters a snake if they asked for fish. Now, this is a reference to Luke's Gospel. If, if our father would not do that, why would he make us already broken? You see, so it introduces an additional question into the theological synthesis that the Christian church has been thinking about for the last 2,000 years. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to propose to you that the doctrine of original sin is not primarily about us, it's primarily about God. Because once you have a doctrine of original sin, it explains how the all-omnipotent, all-loving God could have made something that's good, that is currently broken. And so original sin is an explanation for that. Where, why is it that you and I struggle to go to church on Sunday morning because we know we should do it but we don't what's up with that did God make us that way and that for 2,000 years the Christian gospel has said no he made us good but somewhere along the way we got broken so and if you're a Catholic it becomes particularly difficult because in the Council of Trent in 1546 in the decree of original sin defines original sin and the fall as being necessary components of the, Catholic, of the Catholic faith. And this is, let him be anathema, that's the formula that the church has used for 2,000, 2000 years 
to define doctrine as something revealed by God. So if this is revealed by God, this is in fact the truth of the matter, then you can't get rid of it simply because science appears to contradict it. And this is where faith and reason come together. You have to work it out. Sometimes it will be a long time. Sometimes the struggle could take a decades, if not centuries. But we have to work out how those two come together. How do we come to terms with the scientific and theological debate regarding the historicity of Adam and Eve? That's really what I would like to talk about this evening. And there are going to be four questions that I'm going to answer in order to try to convince you that we can still hold to a coherent view of an original Adam, even in light of the best biology today. We're going to begin by talking about God. I'm a Dominican, and so I'm going to be thinking in the way that St. Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval Dominican philosopher and theologian, articulated, not just because I belong to the same team, but simply because he was brilliant. And he was able to see the brilliance in this sense. He was able to see what many others have struggled to see. And he was able to describe what he saw. And using what he saw as a map, we can start talking about things that he didn't even know about, i.e. Darwinian evolution, but bring that into conversation with the synthesis that he put together nearly 800 years ago. So that's going to be a little bit of philosophy, believe it or not. What is God? How does he work? We're going to talk about science. So we're now going to move to what does the best science tell us about our, the origins of our species. So philosophy, then we're going to get down to uh, biology. Then we're going to talk about the Bible, and, talk, and this is where theology comes in. How does one read the Bible, especially the first several chapters of Genesis, the origins text that describes Adam and Eve. And then we're going to do a little bit of faith and reason. How do you then reconcile church teaching of the history of Adam and Eve with the best science that we have today? So I'm going to try to pack that in in the next 45 minutes or so. So we're going to begin with God, because Thomas begins with God. And if you don't understand God, he will say, you will be prone to making errors for everything else. So we're going to talk about God. We're going to talk about how and why God created through evolution. Now I'm going to take it for granted that the scientific data for evolution is incredibly robust. And it, we can, if you have any questions about that, let's leave it up for the Q&A. You ask, you know, we can talk about what sort of evidence is, do I find convincing for evolutionary theory. Because there's a lot of people who still wonder whether or not evolutionary, the evolutionary account for the origins of life makes sense. So we'll begin with how God creates through evolution. Now, Aquinas, the great saint, the angelic doctor, will say, when you talk about God, you've got to begin talking about things you're most familiar with. Because God is not something that you can see. So what you, he's not something that you can touch. So you've got to go and you've got to start thinking about the things that you are most familiar with. And so we talk about creatures. So we talk about you, me, and everything else under the sun. How do we act? Now, at the end of the day, when we think about acting, we think about creatures moving matter from one place to the other. So when I walk, I'm moving my matter from this point to that point. And for most students who are familiar with physics, this is the way the world works. It's about matter and forces. So we imagine actors and actions as forces interacting with matter in a universe of change and time. E equals mc squared. Einstein pretty much defines that coming in from the tradition of Isaac Newton. So when we talk about how God acts, we, are, we will be tempted to think that God is just a very big creature. We will be tempted to think that what he does is just a really powerful force that can move around really, really big chunks of matter like galaxies. You see, that's how we think. And Aquinas will say, ah. There's a fundamental error there. Because the creature is radically different from his, 
from his, the creator is radically different from his creatures. Now, I have no time to go over the philosophy for this amazing claim that Aquinas will say that God is a verb and we are nouns. Now, my students will get flummoxed when we go through that. Because they'll say, what? I'm like, God is a verb. He is not a noun like you and me. He is a verb with noun-like properties. And there is a philosophical argument for this. And then some one student will say, well, what about the Bible? And I'll say this. Look. So Thomas will say, this is how he defines God. God is the act of existing. He's a verb. Now, if you look at Exodus, if you remember the story from Exodus, when Moses says, hey, God, what's your name? He says, the tetragrammaton, he says, I am who am. Now, the best way is, I am ising. He is a verb. He is the ising verb. My son goes, that's really weird. I go, exactly. He's deeply, deeply, conceptually mysterious. He is a verb. We are nouns. And so God can do things as a verb that nouns can't do. So we should expect that he would act in a radically different way from the way that you and I are most familiar with. And we, we will say this, God acts primarily by giving existence to matter and to forces. Now you notice, you and I can't do that. If I talk to John, where is John? If I talk to John and I say, John, why are you awake? And he'll say, he'll say because you're not boring enough yet. <laughs> and I'm keeping myself awake. But if I ask him, John, why are you existing right now? He can't say, because I'm keeping myself in existence. Now, my students will make this fundamental error. They'll say, but Father, he's alive. Existence is not life. Existence is, are you here or are you not? So the opposite of life is death. The opposite of existing is annihilation. John is not keeping himself in existence. Otherwise, I could say, John, can you please disappear for us right now? And he goes, I can't do that. Exactly. So the question is, what is keeping him in existence? And there's a long involved argument, philosophical argument that says that God, that God is keeping John in existence. He is thinking John in existence. And one of my students, when I was teaching this some years ago, said, oh my goodness. I said, what about it? Zach? He goes, I just realized something. I said, what did you realize? He said, I'm God's imaginary friend. <laughs> and he is absolutely correct. You see, when we have imaginary friends, we can't give those imaginary friends real existence. But when God imagines us into existence, we are. And this is profoundly consoling, because I have students who struggle with depression sometimes, and they'll say, I, don't, I think God's forgotten me. I said, go look at the mirror. He goes, why? I said, are you still there? Oh, yeah. If you are still there, he has to be thinking about you. Because if he stopped thinking about you, you'd be gone. So God consistently and always thinks us into existence. We can't do that with each other. We certainly can't do it with ourselves. God does that. So he gives existence to matter as particular kinds of things with specific natures. Now, how does he do this? The way that I have to show you is to talk about this. I have to talk about an author writing a note with a pen. Thank you. And I ask, who wrote the note? Well, you're going to say, the author wrote the note. But you can also say, the pen wrote the note too. Both of them wrote the note completely. This is considered instrumental causality. The author and the pen were needed to write the note. They were writing it together. The author is called the principal cause, while the pen is the instrumental cause. Now you notice that the note has characteristics of both the author and the pen, because it has the author's handwriting and the pen's ink color. So the note is a fruit of both of them working intimately with, with each other. And this is the model we talk about when we talk about how God works with his creatures. Because you see, when I ask this question, a rose bush blooms a rose, and I ask my students, is God acting here? 
because of the way that we think about science, we, have, we don't even ask that question. We just talk about genes, we talk about signaling pathways, we talk about different molecules that are being transported through the phloem of the stem. At the end of the day, we don't even ask if God is acting here, but we can ask that question. Because you see, when a rose bush blooms a rose, the rose that did not exist three weeks ago now exists. You understand? So the rose bush cannot give existence to the rose. So we have to say that the, this new rose must receive its existence from the first cause. So God is working with the rose bush to bloom the rose. So he has to act when the rose bush is blooming. And it works this way. He creates the rose bush. He gives the rose bush the rose bush nature. It's not a dog. It's a rose bush because God made it a rose bush. But he also has to act with a rose bush so it can bloom a rose. So it can produce an existing rose from a non-existing nothing. And so you see, the way we will talk about this is the rose is an instrumental cause. Remember the pen? In the blooming of the rose where God is the principal cause. Now you wouldn't say, you will notice, God is work, the author is being fully authored when he's writing. The pen is fully penned when it, he's, when it is writing. So here, it's not that the rose bush and God are duking it out over who's in charge. Both of them are working fully and engaged concurrently to produce this rose. So God, both God and the rose bush are acting when the rose blooms. And you notice that the rose has characteristics from both God and the rose bush. It is existing because of God. It is a rose bush because of the rose. It's a rose because of the rose bush. Now this actually happens every single time a creature acts, right? So he acts with creatures to realize the perfection of their natures. And what's so striking is that he does this with you as well. So if I ask you, I want you to imagine a polar bear, right? Are you thinking of a polar bear right now? Now, five seconds ago, that image of the polar bear didn't exist. And now it does. So God had to work with you together to produce that existing imagination image of the rose bush. So what you discover when you, when you see the world this way is God is working intimately with every single creature at every single moment to realize this. I was going to bring up the example of a nor'easter, but I realized that's not really apropos here. So, you know, when, 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 you're, in, when you're in New England, we get the nor, nor'easters once a week. You just go out and you imagine every single snowflake is there right now because God is thinking that snowflake and keeping it into existence. And so everything we do, God is acting with us except for sin. And I have no opportunity or time to get into how you can explain that. But there is a, there, there's, a, there's, there's an explanation for how that, will, that is intelligible as well. So when, so when we talk about evolution, you see, evolution is about God working with creatures with dynamic nature. See, a lot of people will say, there is God here, and there's evolution here. And you have to choose between one or the other. And what Thomas Aquinas was able to argue and show 800 years ago is that cannot be true. Because if evolution involves creatures acting, which it does, then God is intimately involved with that very act as well. So the dynamic universe that is evolving is God working through that. So you can say the following thing. God creates through evolution, and God designs through chance. <coughs> And I have no time to defend these statements in full. But there are clear reasons why you can say something like this. Notice, people will often put creation or evolution, design or chance, and within this very sophisticated metaphysical account, there's no choice. No, you don't have to choose one or the other. God is working uh, through everything that you see in the world. Here's a question. My students will say, why, why does God create through evolution? Why did he just do it the way that it's described in the Bible? Six days and he took a nap. 
Why exactly does he do it this way? And, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to refer to Aquinas again, go back 800 years. So um, this is Thomas Aquinas in his great work called the Summa Theologiae. And the question that, that was asked of him 800 years ago was the following. Why doesn't God do everything by himself? Why does he use parents to make kids? Think about it, right? God doesn't have to use parents to make kids. He could just make kids by himself. But why does he use parents to make kids? And the idea here, and this is what Thomas will say, is that if God governed alone, things would be deprived of perfection of causality, wherefore all that is affected by many would not be accomplished by one. I must say, Father, translate that into English, please. <laughs> and what he's saying here is the following. At the end of the day, he will say, it is only God can invite creatures and make creatures that are able to function as authentic causes. Further translation, you and I can write a book. We can never make a book that writes itself. It, it, it requires much more power in order to make something do something on its own than actually just go ahead and do it. It's a very striking thought. And Aquinas is saying that it is more fitting. It actually shows how incredibly powerful God is, that he can create new forms of life using existing forms. It is more powerful that God can make parents rather than just make kids. You see? Now, so this is, and you have Lao Tzu. Give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish. Give him causality. Feed him for a lifetime. It is harder. Think about it for those of us here are professors. It is harder to teach someone to think on their own rather than just to give them the answers that they need on a test, right? And it's a better teacher that can make a student learn enough that he can teach himself. And when you take that and expand it to the universe, this is one plausible explanation for why God would have created through evolution, rather than through the, the special creation that you see described in Genesis. Second reason is that Aquinas was asked 800 years ago, why did God create many things? Why not just a few things? And Aquinas says at the end of the day, God is so perfectly beautiful that in order to reflect his beauty, he had to make an infinite number of beautiful things. The example I use when I teach this, I say, if you wanted to interview an artist, would you prefer to look at one painting or go into his gallery in order to look at all the paintings that are on show? My students will say, I want to see the gallery because the more pictures I see, the more is reflected in each portrait. You have the landscape, you've got still life. His talent becomes more, you can see his talent in its, rich, in its richness because of the abundance of pictures. The same thing can be said of creation. You know, if, so I say this, right? So if you think about evolution, God has been creating over a three billion year period. And in that period, he made four billion species, four billion paintings. Compared to at any one moment in time, there's about eight million today. So think of it. So think of it. You've got a limited gallery. You got a ton of paintings. So what you do is you can't cram them all in there, especially if some of the paintings are incompatible. You can't put a T-Rex right next to an elephant. They won't last long. Well, the elephant won't last long. <laughs> So what you want to do is you want to display a T-Rex and an elephant is you set up a time when the dinosaurs take over your gallery. And there is an amazing series of dinosaurs. And then you've got the KT transition. There is an asteroid go boom. They all get wiped out. You take, there's a pier where the paintings go out. A new set of paintings come in. Now we live in the age of mammals. And here we are. And so the idea is that 
If you spread out your display over three billion years, you get to show more things. And the more pictures you show, the more it reveals the glory of God. Which is why it is incredibly fitting that God did it this way rather than the other way. Because it shows his power better. People never realize that. I didn't realize that. It was amazing when I read this. It's like, wow. Of course Aquinas was not thinking about T-Rex and elephants. But once you understand what he was thinking, you can see that the principle applies even to today. And so you see something like this. All right, we're moving now to the science. And I'm not quite sure your scientific background. We're in a primarily healthcare-related university. So I'm going to assume some, but I'm not sure if everyone has. So I'm going to start from the beginning. So this is a genome. So the genome is the genetic information of an organism. Uh, it's primarily localized in what is called the nucleus, which is the headquarters of the cell, a central control room. And you have the very famous chromosomes. There's also a mitochondrial genome, 37 human genes. And this is the powerhouse of the cell. And what's really interesting, of course, if you are aware of this, is that the nuclear genome, we inherit half of our chromosomes from dad and half from mom, but the mitochondrial genome, we inherit only from our mothers. If you take one of those chromosomes and you stretch it out, you have the iconic <coughs> double helix. And it's really striking, I tell my students, a human, chrom a human genome is about seven feet long, and you're trying to stick it into a nucleus of a cell, the largest cell, is about the size of the period at the end of the time G Roman 12 font. So you've got the DNA that's this long, you're trying to put it in there. You can't just squish it like spaghetti, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to find that information. So the next 100 years, what we're, one of the things we're trying to do is, how the heck did, does the cell organize that information in a way that we can access it, access that information quickly when you get the flu? So this is uh, DNA. If you take DNA that looks like this, you can portray it this way. This is the gene that my students and I have been studying for the last eight years. It's Bax inhibitor. And if you knew the genetic code, you would know that ATG is the beginning of the gene, and a TAA, the stop codon, is the end of the gene. And one of the reasons why I bring this up is I want to show that DNA can be understood in the same way as text is. You have a capital letter at the beginning, you have a period at the end, and you and I have about three billion of these letters. And each one of these letters represents a chemical molecule, a base pair. So when you see the DNA can be compared to text, one of the things you can then see, hopefully, is that you can compare text. You can compare uh, this letter and that letter. And you can determine the relationships amongst the different texts. So, we're at a university, think about 10 final exams. There are similar answers, some of them are identical. Immediately you go, what does this tell you about the relationship? There's a common origin. We call that cheating. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's a common origin. This exam is the original. This is derived from that. And the reason why I know that is because the answers are similar. And in fact, you can compare different exams. So if you had 10 kids, they all cheated. You can figure out pretty much who cheated from whom. You can tell who was the original, well, for the most part. And you work it out, and you have a higher a tree of who copied from who, when did she copy it from him, and you work it out into a little pattern. We do the same thing with genomes. So we can do something like this. So this is the DNA of a gene called casein beta. It's the most common protein in cow's milk. And the common letters are highlighted. And some of them you see, so cow and deer have more in common than, for example, whale and hippo. So one of the things that's really striking is the most closely related mammal to whales is the hippo, which is why it suggests that whales had terrestrial origins before they returned to the ocean, because they're most related to the hippo. This is one of the reasons why uh, we, you know, whales are not fishes, uh, they are mammals. But we can do this and we can come up with a tree of who copied from whom. This is one of the examples of the tree. And we, so we, there are a couple of principles that geneticists use. Most more closely related genomes have a more recent common ancestor. Again, if you have two kids with 10 answers identical, 
you know that they had to have copied later in the exam rather than the one kid who only has one answer because he probably copied at the beginning and gave up. So you can figure out the timing based upon the commonality. So we can do that. The second thing is that we can estimate the time since they had that common exam by the number of answers that they held in common. So we do this with genomes, and you have something like this. So you compare the human genome, the chimpanzee, and the gorilla, and you can calculate about 6 million years ago there was a common exam, and then 10 million years ago there was a common exam amongst all three. And we can do this further. You take the human, you expand it, you have Denisovians, Neanderthals, modern humans. Now, I always tell this joke because my students will say, you know, they're extinct, but the student will say, Father, they live in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have Neanderthals here, Denisovians, they're from Central Asia. And again, these are the dates. Now, you can take modern humans, you can expand that even further, and what you discover is that for every single human being who lives today, the seven plus billion people, we are descended from a common exam that lived about 100,000 years ago in Africa. So despite all the differences you see, the data suggests there's a common population, 10, 100,000, there's all plus or minus, there's always going to be some window, probabilistically. And so we know this. Uh, and so the current model is that our species evolves in Africa, and then we basically migrate over the last 100,000 years out of Africa all over the world. And you see, for example, this is the about 14, 15,000 years ago, you have the crossing over, and the, so the ancestors of the Native Americans are actually related primarily to those who live in Mongolia, and you can see the ethnic similarities between, between these different populations because of this. What's striking here, you see, is Australia, the humans arrived about, what is it, 40,000 years ago, and we know that there's great extinctions of the megafauna. These are the large animals you see large birds, and birds seven, eight feet tall. <coughs> the thing is, when we arrived, these birds had never met us before. So they were not scared of us. So we went and had turkey day every day. <laughs> and we wiped them out. Because one of the things you don't realize is that if you went to Antarctica today, the penguins are not going to be scared of you. Because they have not evolved the dip, the, the dip, the um, avoidance behaviors that they need to avoid people like you. They'll just walk up to you. Now, talk about squirrels on campus. <laughs> they have avoidance behavior because if not, they get eaten or anything else, right? So what happens, we can trace events in biological history to the appearance of our species as it migrates. So there's a consensus, you have a common origin dated about 200,000, 100,000 years ago in Africa, and they dispersed from Africa about 60,000 years ago. These dates are fluctuating by tens of thousands of years, but not much. All right, the question now is how many mating pairs 65,000 years ago would explain the genetic diversity we see today? Translate that into this. If I get, here's the, Daddy Beagle and Mommy Beagle, and now I've got all these Beagle babies. And I go, does this dog pedigree make sense? You go, yeah. So this makes sense. These three baby Beagles showed up from this. If I did this, <laughs> you'd go, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> you see what I mean? You would say, at a minimum, it has to be this. So even if you didn't know that, by looking at the, what's going on right now, you can deduce that there may, must have been at least two pairs of dogs to explain the genetic diversity of dogs that we have today. We can do this with humans. You can ask this to explain the genetic diversity of the seven plus billion people today. How many original pairs had there, did there have to be 65,000 years ago? It's about 1,000 to 2,000. It can never go down to one pair. It's only 1,000 to 2,000. It's probably on that order in a very small geographical location. We're not quite sure exactly where, in Africa. So this is why 
you have all these theologians basically saying, we've got to get rid of Adam and Eve because of this data. All right. One more thing is that there was interbreeding between uh, these different uh, hominid species. So I was at a conference and I met someone who said, Father, if you want to get your DNA scanned, 23 and me. I'm like, sure. Mm -hmm. So it turns out I've got like 3 or 4% Neanderthal DNA. And for the most part, for, for any of us here who are not descended from an African ethnic population, you are going to have between 2 to 4% of your DNA descended from Neanderthals, primarily associated with the immune system. And for those of you who know biology, you'll understand why there's selection for genes that make the, the immune system more robust. Now, so the, we know that the individuals today descended from the Africans, which are the original human population, they, do not, they don't have that because the Neanderthals didn't live in Africa. They lived in Europe and in Asia. And so our ancestors had to run into the Neanderthals in order to breed with them. And there was a paper it published, I believe, in Nature a few weeks ago where we now show that the Neanderthals and the Denisovians also interbred. We've actually found an individual, half of her genes come from a Neanderthal and the other half come from a Denisovian. So we know there's a whole bunch of interbreeding. If you're a Melanesian, and a Melanesian is someone who's descended from the, from the original Aboriginal tribes in Australia and New Zealand, so we're talking about the Aborigines and the Maori, you have a certain percentage of your genes from the Denisovians. So we know that there's interbreeding going on here. So that's, that's where we are. That's the science of it. So now we're going to go talk about theology. What do we talk, what, with regards to the Bible, how do we read the Bible? So this is the standard story, of course. Uh, you go to the book of Genesis, and you've got Adam and Eve, and then Eve is pulled out from a rib. Now, so this is from Genesis, the, the text from Genesis, and this is the first mention. Adam and wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So the question now is, how do we understand the scriptural text from Genesis? What does the sacred author want us to understand? Now, if you ask this question theologically, you're asking this, what is the literal meaning of the scriptural text? We have to ask, what does literal meaning mean? It means this. Remember this, an author writing a note with a pen. So, Sacred scripture has two authors, a divine author, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and then the human author who is writing. Both of them are working together. And it's interesting, the divine author and the human author together give existence to every word of the sacred text. Now this is important because a lot of people assume that what God is doing is he's whispering into the ear, it's like, all right, you power. <laughs> and, and, and so the, 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 the human person is now simply a scribe who, has, who is not able to put into the text his own personality, his own culture. And there are uh, strands of Christianity that hold to that. But from Catholic Christianity, that's not the case. And we'll say why. Because God respects the uniqueness of each individual human being. And um, I have a Muslim student in my class, and this is a very striking question for when we talk about the similarities and differences, because with regards to the Quran, uh, Muhammad is thought to be a direct, was basically a scribe. He goes into a trance and he writes. But from the Catholic Christian perspective, God respects the human author so much that he uses, works with, works through, works alongside, as an author writing a pen, all of those unique qualities that the human author had writing several thousand years ago. So what happens now is the literal sense of sacred scripture is the meaning directly intended by the human author working as an instrumental cause with God that is conveyed in his words. Now, you, this is really important. A lot of people don't realize this. 
it is not enough to translate a text word, text word for word, in order to obtain its literal sense. If you just read scripture, the danger is you're reading it as a 21st century person, not as the author who wrote it a long time ago. I'll give you this example from Matthew 18. How often should I forgive? And the Savior of the world says, 70 times 70. 7 times 7, 7 times 70. So there's this little cartoon here. 70 times 7 minus 34 seems like a pretty tough problem for second grade. And the kid goes, it's not for school. This is the number of times I still have to forgive my dumb big brother. <laughs> and so the literalistic meaning, taking that text, is to say 490 times. That's it. That's what Jesus said, 490 times. But you see, that is to forget that the Savior was speaking to people whose understanding of numbers was different from our own. So you have to ask, what is the Bible meaning of the number seven? And seven is perfection. So the literal meaning is the perfection times perfection is an infinite number of times. Which is why, what is the number of the beast in the book of Revelation? It's 666. It's the trinity of imperfection. It is one less than the perfect number of seven. So, will the beast have 666 on his forehead? Maybe. But what this is trying to convey most profoundly <coughs> is that the beast is anti-perfection. It is one less than the perfect number, which is why it has to be 666. And the trinity, because God is the trinity. So the number of God should be 777. And the, the number of the beast is one less of each of those. And it changes the way you look at a text. Because now you're trying to read it, not as a 21st century person read it, but reading it as someone for whom it was written thousands of years ago. That takes an enormous amount of study, especially since, for the most part, we don't read Hebrew. We don't read Greek. That's terrible. Oh, I struggled with Greek in the seminary. It was terrible. I was studying it every single day. I just needed to pass that exam. <laughs> So what did the human author intend when he wrote the Eden narrative? That's the question you have to ask, right? And what you will see is that if you look back at the culture and society of the time, you come up with something like this. This is the Athrasis, the Babylonian epic from the 18th century before the arrival of the Savior. And you will see that if you compare the Athrasis text and the Genesis text, there's an enormous amount of similarity. It turns out that the, Genesis, the sacred author writing Genesis is responding to a Babylonian account of the creation of the world. And what you see there is that the intention of the racist author was similar to the intention of the Genesis author, and that is to describe a prehistory for their peoples. It's about how God worked with them. Now you notice, we do not think that the racist text is historical then we should not consider the Genesis narrative historical either in the same way because the intentions were similar. But that's not the end of the story because remember, we have to talk about the divine author because God was also writing. And we have to ask, what is the, the, the intention of the divine author? And when you talk about this theologically, we ask this, what is the fuller meaning of the scriptural text from Genesis? This is a Latin word called sensus planior. So you have the literal meaning, and now the fuller meaning. Both are important in reading uh, all of sacred scripture. And this is the Pontifical Biblical Commission. This is a document from the Catholic Church. The fuller meaning is defined as a deeper meaning of the text intended by God, but not clearly expressed by the human author. You see, God can do this. He could write a text using a human author giving meaning to the text that the human author may himself not even have been aware of because of his limitations as a human creature. But God is able to do that. So what do we do is we look elsewhere in the Bible because God writes the whole thing, and we ask, are there other texts in the Bible that help us to understand what God meant there? And in Romans, in the fifth chapter of Romans, the apostle, the great apostle to the Gentiles, St. Paul, will talk about how Christ is the new Adam, because there was an old Adam. 
And it is from this fuller meaning that the Catholic tradition will say the following. The, this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The account of the fall in Genesis uses figurative language but affirms a historical primal event. You see, so it, so it is using figurative languages like a phrasis, but there is history behind it. And we have to, and the history is, there was an event. There was an original fall freely committed by our first parents. It might not have involved a tree. It's not involving a talking snake. But there was an original couple, and there was an original fall. And this is from sacred scripture, but understood in its fuller meaning, not just limited to the text from Genesis. So now we have to talk about how do we put those all together. I gave you the science, now I'm going to, I gave you the theology. How the heck are we going to put it together? This is the faith in science. And this is still a work in progress. I'm writing a book. And what I do is I go around talking about what I'm thinking about. And you guys can grill it. And I go, oh, that's a good question. And I change things. So this is a work in progress. I give this talk in several places in the country, but everyone is different because it really depends on where I'm, what I'm thinking about uh, when I give the talk. So it's moving along. It's evolving. Uh, so how do we do that? I'm going to tell you that I think we can still defend Adam after Darwin, and that there was a single historical original human being who was the universal ancestor for all of us. And he felt that's why we're in trouble. And so how are we going to do this? The first thing is we need to distinguish, and this is where we're doing the actual work. You have to distinguish Homo sapiens as a biological species from human beings as a natural kind. Uh, I was first a biologist before I was a theologian, so I didn't even realize that this difference exists. So when, you, when, when, when biologists talk about philosophy, when we talk about species, we talk about a cluster of biological characteristics held in common by a population of individuals. And what we do there is we come up with a whole series of definitions. We don't tell this to Bio 103. I teach Bio 103, which is the freshman bio. It's my favorite class to teach. Um, we just, when they tell what's a species, I tell they can be reproductively producing individuals. Well, that's actually only one. That's called the biological species concept. There's a whole bunch of different ones. You go, why is there a whole bunch? Because the biological species concepts lead to certain unintelligibilities, incongruences. So um, when you would presuppose the cluster theory, you cannot have a single distinct historical moment when one species becomes another. So if I ask, what is the English language? Define it for me. You will come up with a cluster account. And then I said, when did Middle English become Waddle English? There will not be one moment in time. Now people will say Shakespeare. But that's really, there's, there's when I've given this talk a couple places, they go, two, 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 two moments. One is Shakespeare, and the other one was the writing of the King James Bible. And the reason for this is really striking, because when the King James Bible was, was translated, when it was written, and it was spread all over England, everyone who was speaking their own, own, own local dialect of English decided that they had to speak the English that Jesus spoke. <laughs> because obviously that's the best English. But you can see how this makes sense. So what happens is that the text of the King James Version becomes the template for the King's English. And so it begins to standardize English in a way that no other, because I mean, no, you know, you can't go into someone's town and say, hey, bad news, your English is weird. They're like, but who are you? But now you say, that's not like the English that Jesus spoke. Like, oh, wow. I gotta change that. <laughs> so, so, that's actually what happens. It's striking when you give talks and there's an English professor and the audience can say, I never thought about that. But at the end of the day, we can't identify a moment. It's all ad hoc. Here's one of the problems that you face when you have the biological species concept. So this is the California salamander, and this is called a ring species, so there's, there's uh, debates in the literature about what really constitutes a ring species. 
But for the most part, what I want to show you is that this, so let's talk about mating and having viable progeny. That's the definition of species. Well, if that's the case, this is the same species as this, the same species as this, the same species as this, same thing going the other way. These two kinds can, can mate, these two kinds can mate, these two kinds can mate, but these two can. So it becomes very intellectually puzzling because this is the same species as this, as that, as that, going around this way, but, it, but these two are not the same species going this way. Now there are reasons why this is the case biologically in terms of gene flow and, and geographic isolation, but conceptually it's not airtight. There are problems with this definition, which is why people are coming up with all these other alternative ways. Now, but the other way we can do it is we can say, look, let's just look at us. Instead of going in the past looking forward, let's start in the present going backwards. What are we like? And, the, and philosophers will say, we are rational animals. This is Aristotle, this is before Christ, rational animal. So if you want to ask, when did we start, we have to look, when does rationality start? So you have to ask, what is rationality? And I'm going to propose to you that it's, it's necessarily linked to language. Because... Um, and so what we have to look for in the historical record is the appearance of language. Now, um, this is a proposal. This is what the heart of my book that I'm writing on. The capacity for language is inherently tied to the capacity for abstraction. Abstraction, people go, what is that? Abstraction is your unique ability to understand non-material reality. And the, the best way I came, I figured this out was when I was a fifth grade teacher. I was a fifth grade teacher before I went to get my doctorate. Um, I had to learn <coughs> to teach kids fractions. It's really, really hard to teach an 11 year old who's never thought about a half what a half is. I didn't realize how difficult it is. So I had to take a pizza, cut it in half, that's a half. Then I took uh, a chocolate bar, broke in half, that's a half took a water, and they're looking, <laughs> they're looking, and they're just flummoxed, flummoxed. And then one of them, I remember the kid's name is John, he's now a, a banker in Hong Kong. Um, <laughs> I discovered this on Facebook. He looks at it, he looks at it, he goes, oh, he got it, he got the half. Now, his class is like, what is it? And he can't say, he can only point. Half, 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 half. So the problem, of course, is a half, in another way is also whole. Because I can take that half and I can break that half and half. You, I didn't do that because a poor kid would go. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, half, the ability to understand half is, an, is to take something that is intelligible but not really there. The half doesn't exist. The apple exists, the pizza exists, but the half is something you have to understand. The same thing with jokes. Jokes requires abstraction. Have you ever tried to explain to someone who doesn't get it? It's really hard. You just wait, can't you see it? No. What do you, it's because it's the ability to abstract. The classical account is that only in this way are we unique. We, animals can remember, animals can imagine, animals can feel. The only thing that's different between us and animals that defines our rationality is this power to abstract. And this is from Aquinas. Aquinas, 800 years ago, begins to think about this problem. I'm going to skip it for now. And I'm proposing that we are rational animals because we are also speaking primates, the only primates that can speak. Now, it's interesting. If you're interested, you should read this book. Robert Berwick, Noam Chomsky, father of modern linguistics, both of whom are professors at my alma mater at MIT, they have a book called Why Only Us? Language and Evolution that explores this question about the evolution of language. And they basically define language. So my students say, Father, my dog speaks to me. <laughs> Animals have language. And so you have to define language. You have to define it in a very specific way. It's defined this way. 
language, human language, in contrast to other forms of verbal communication, involves merge. And this is the definition of merge. The best thing for me to do is just to show it to you rather than to tell you. This is merge. Now look at this. Peter is too angry to eat. Wonderful English line, English sentence. It has two meanings because of merge. The first meaning is Peter is too angry he can't eat. The other one is Peter is too angry I can't eat him. <laughs> so that, that's abstraction. You notice? If you didn't see that, I can't explain it to you. This is like a joke. At the very heart of language. Now, the reason why this is the case is they've done this. If you look at animals, they see, they see sounds and vocal sounds in a linear fashion. They'll start from the left to the right. And we can do this now because you can, what you do is you can record a bird song and then using some software package, you can move them around and you flummox the bird. The bird has no clue. It's the same song, but you just move it around completely, completely flummox. They do it in a linear fashion, left to right, or first out, first in. You and I can do it hierarchically. The very same sentence, you and I, in our minds, can reconstruct that sentence into several meanings precisely because of merge. I'm proposing that merge is inherently tied to abstraction, which is why language and abstraction are intimately related. Now, what's really interesting is that if you look at Noam Chomsky, <coughs> he will say, and this makes sense, Somewhere in that group, that group is that 1,000, 2,000 mating pairs, a single human being evolved a mutation that altered the structure of its brain so that that creature was now able to do merge. Prior to it, there was no merge. That individual had merged. Now, what's interesting is all of us have merged, which means that we are all descended from this single person. Because that's the nature of mutations, right? Uh, 100,000 years is not a long time uh, in biological history. It's not, we don't expect multiple mutations to happen independently. If, in this account, the idea is that that person evolved the ability for human language, for merge, that person is out. And we are descended from that individual. So the idea here is, it's interesting because a lot of my students say, but how can you only have one person? You need to have two people to talk. And my answer is, and, according, and their answer is, who do you spend most of your time talking to? Yourself. See, we, we don't think about language. See, when we think about language, we think that language is primarily to communicate with the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the kid, the wife. No. It evolves primarily as a cognitive tool that allows the individual to conceptualize his world. And then, when you have two of those together, they invent the language. And we know this is the case because it's happened several times. The most famous kind is in Nicaragua. So they, were, they, they brought together a whole bunch of deaf Nicaraguan kids, and they wanted to teach the kids American Sign Language. So they sent a Nicaraguan up to the States. He learned American Sign Language, went back down. He was not a native speaker of American Sign Language, so he's there trying to teach the kids. They discovered that in the playground, when the kids went out, because they never met other deaf kids, and so now you have a bunch, a population, they invented the language like that. It's now called Nicaraguan Sign Language. It's completely different from American Sign Language. They would go in there and like, yeah, 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 let's go out and play. And then they would, they, so they, when you put two speaking primates together, they will create a language because each of them is able to conceptualize linguistically. And the idea here is that, that what you have is that the language evolves as an organ for thought, not for communication. It appears only once in one person. And that what this involves is the ability, the cognitive ability for merge. And so at the end of the day, you can reconcile it this way. So hominins evolves into archaic humans who are anatomically modern, about 200,000, 200,000 years ago. 
And at a single moment in time, God infuses, so now this is a theological account, God infuses an individual hominin with a spiritual soul after he has evolved the capacity for language because of single mutation in his genome. All of us carry that mutation. We are all descended from this individual. That's a biological, empirical fact. And so what happens is this individual becomes a rational animal in a state of racial justice. This is a theological concern. And they, the descendants of this individual will migrate out of Africa. So my students will say, what happened to the non-speaking ones? And I say, what happens is that the, the, once you have speaking ones, and they're speaking to each other, there is enormous selective advantage. Because they can now gang up on the ones who don't talk. <laughs> they can plan, and from an evolutionary perspective, you know, we, I don't like committee meetings, but you can see how committee meetings actually get things done. Once you get things working together, you can build things, you can plan hunts for animals. Uh, it's not like you're just signing, you're actually anticipating future, past, present. And this will also be self-selection, right? So once you have a speaking primate, that speaking primate is probably going to mate with another speaking primate, not with a cousin that's not speaking. Because there's going to be self-selection. You're going to be talking with life. And so you have a situation where within a few generations, this population will outcompete the non-speaking population. So everyone we have today is actually speaking. So this is um, just, just a summary for what I just told you. And so hopefully I've begun to suggest to you that you can reconcile evolution with divine action and that evolutionary theory does not make monogenism untenable. Monogenism is a theological, philosophical account of a single couple over polygenism, which is many couples. And that the evolved capacity for language is a marker for this. And that what I hopefully uh, and this is something I continue to work on, is that evolutionary theory does not undermine the foundations for the Christian doctrine of original sin. Because once you have this original person, this person can fall. And you know, my students say, how long does it take for him to fall? If you've read um, Dante, if you read Dante, if you read the Paradiso, uh, when Dante meets Adam, he says, how long, were you, how long did it take before you fell? You know what the answer is? Seven hours. So that's it. So, so Adam realized that he was human, and then seven hours later, boom, he'd fall. A lot of people assume that you know, Adam and Eve were kind of hanging out in this wonderful spa for <laughs> 10, 20 years, and then all of a sudden, there was the snake, there was this apple, it fell. And, but the Christian account doesn't require that. It just requires that the human being was created by, uh, was created and he falls. And the, the time in between that doesn't necessarily have to be in anything more than minutes even, right? And once that happens, you have an account of the fall. So this for, for my friends at MIT, this is all, they're like, this is all foolishness because they do not, so, their worldview has no place for this kind of activity whatsoever. And, and I go, that's okay. That's because each tradition has particular issues that you have to deal with. You have to deal with the question of freedom. So how, why are you free? And this is, this is their issue, determinism. Why, why are you free? Um, why do they put people into prisons if it's just a matter of there's no difference between what we do and what dogs do? So they have their own intellectual challenges. The Christian tradition has its own, and we each has to we, we work within that tradition to find a coherent account that, as Alistair and Michael Tyber put it, would outcompete its rivals. So I just wanted to end. Um, I have I so I always say this is my honest 480 colloquium in science and religion. They were the ones who first asked me about Adam and Eve. I never thought about it. And they wanted to ask, so I began thinking about it, what, six years ago now? Thinking, at that point, I wasn't thinking of writing a book. I was still trying to get tenure. So, you know, I was <laughs> So what happens, we just, and it just kept going, and 
there, it became incredibly fascinating to think about as to talk to other people. This is Father Heiss and Marie Cordell, and I put him up there because when he entered the Order of Creatures, he was a creationist, and it was wonderful to speak to him, to see uh, where the intellectual challenges were, the kind of <coughs> questions. He challenged me, I challenged him. We had an ongoing conversation over many years. Um, one of the things that I realized is that individuals who are creationists, they have reasons for that. It's not that they're just being crazy or dumb or foolish. Um, especially when evolution is being used today as a tool to destroy faith, often young people are faced with a choice of, do I choose my grandmother or my science professor? And it's really tough because my grandmother, she has this view of the world. My biology teacher says this, what's going on? And so part of my responsibility and great privilege as a Dominican, a geek for God, is to begin to address some of these apparent inconsistencies to help my brothers and sisters to maneuver through this. Right? Because if you think you have to choose, you're going to choose. And what's sad is that a lot of young people think they must choose science because science is truer than anything that religion says. And religion is just subjective, that has to do primarily with opinion, while science is real and true and fact. And this kind of exercise helps them to see that it's, you have to be a little bit more sophisticated than that to really get to the truth of the matter. So I thank my brother, Father Heisen, who is now the pastor of our church in Washington, D.C. This is my laboratory. So I have a huge laboratory. Uh, the Dead Yeast Society, um, we kill yeast. Where, so I'm a yeast molecular biologist. And this is what yeast, so this is, this is yeast right there. And uh, we study cancer and look, look at the mechanisms of program cell death and apoptosis primarily by looking at yeasts and models of organism. And, um, but late at night, when we're sitting there talking about our gels, they all, because we have a very solid humanities and liberal arts core at Providence College, it is not surprising that my students will, and will ask me questions about the evil of Brothers Karamazov while we're running a restriction enzyme gel to figure out if PSD will cut our plasmid. And so that kind of conversation has been incredibly rewarding and enriching for me as a molecular biologist. First and foremost, because these are, the, these are the questions that human beings should ask. But sometimes we don't know where to ask it. And I have to, um, I, my, my lab gets grants, uh, so I have to thank every time I talk, I gotta thank, thank my, the federal government for giving us grants. <laughs> we get grants from the NSF and the NIGMS. And then uh, we got a grant from, and we are actually, I just wrote another, I'm writing another grant. We have a website called mysticevolution.org, which is an attempt to help Catholic Christians who are grappling with the question of faith and reason to bring it together. We are currently uh, writing a second grant to the Templeton Foundation to, like, we want to, so a couple of things we want to do. We want to come up with a textbook for homeschooling families that address the question of faith and reason with regards to <coughs> biology and theology. And then we want to deal with the questions that our brothers and sisters or philosophers and theologians who are attempting to creationism have. There's some really, really good questions that need to be answered, and we're trying to, to get a group of people together to think through these questions for them. Thank you so much for your kind uh,